Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. of Night Light. When we read 1984, we learn that the Ministry of Truth is housed in a pyramidal-shaped building. Was Orwell stating that the ancient past set a precedent for his writing of this classic in the 1940s? <clears throat> uh, the God for whom St. Martins in the Fields was built, became a uh, church for Big Brother. Other than Christianity replacing you know, the Greek and Roman gods, are there other examples of gods you know, replacing uh, you know, earlier gods? Um, so you, that's kind of like t setting up a uh, this theme of precedence that we're going to get into uh, tonight, and uh, I think um, some powers uh, don't want Dawn and me talking about this, and we'll probably get a low, S low ESG score anyways, and you know, to call in from my parents' basement. Just like Richard, but uh, <laughs> Richard Searage show. But uh, yeah, uh, I want to thank Richard for uh, connecting us. So, but anyhow, tonight's show is important be uh, because Crimes and Cover-ups is, is a terrific book, as well as it's setting the stage for the show we're going to uh, be doing in about uh, was it like mid-April. Um, on Washington Irving, and we'll be discussing his working with the uh, Jackson and Tyler administrations and knowing uh, many other presidents and other leading figures of his age. So do, do we really know the true characters of our presidents? What precedents did the 46 presidents set for today's events and future generations. Our guest, Don Jeffries, identifies as a historian, he is the host of the I Protest podcast, and he's the author of Crimes and Cover-Ups in American Politics, 1776 to 1963, Bullyocracy, and other publications that could be found on Amazon and other reputable uh, bookstores can be heard over the passage of time on Friday from 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern on rothkin.com uh, forward slash America Unplugged and the Donald Jeffries Show, which covers the passage of time on Wednesday from 6 to 8 on okelly.com. Hi, Don. How you doing? Hey, Mark. How you doing? Good to be with you. Oh, no. 
Uh, glad you're here. It had a rough start, but uh, yeah, everything's working out fine. Yeah, um, I'm sorry to let you know that Nightlight does not give hundred thousand dollar gift bags, trips to Scottish castles, and liposuctions <laughs> to our guests. But thanks for being with us, anyways. Okay, that's disappointing, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, since uh, Nightlight Part Two is more of a history theme show, um, I really enjoy your crimes and cover ups. It's a balanced look at the founding fathers, early American events like the Whiskey Rebellion, War of eighteen twelve, uh, many presidents. Um, you really did a terrific job on giving us a, a fuller biography of many of these people, and you know we can get into later on while we don't know this uh, information. But let's uh, start off with President Lincoln considered you know, the first or second most important president uh, beloved by you know, m uh, most people. Uh, y your research revealed aspects of him that uh, we may not know about. So maybe we can start off with his early career and build up to, obviously, the Civil War. Yeah, well, my take on Lincoln, obviously, is, uh, <clears throat> is a lot different than just about everyone else's. And uh, I, I'm indebted to Thomas D. Lorenzo, who uh, wrote Lincoln on Math. He uh, uh, was really the first guy in modern history to uh, to show that side of Lincoln. And I, you know, I was certainly influenced by him, and I quoted him a lot in the book. But um, Lincoln, yeah, Lincoln, is. Uh, we had this myth of him as uh, kind of being a modern log cabin and uh, – he was, uh, you know, a poor guy, a poor rail splitter, and all that stuff. And I go through all that. I mean, Lincoln, in reality, Lincoln's father was the uh, the largest landowner in, in, in uh, I don't know if it was the state, but certainly in that part of the country where he was at. So he, he was hardly poor. And uh, he, you know, he these these kind of apocryphal stories about him, and they're they're they're. Uh, you know, people kind of tend to, they don't believe the George Washington stories. You know, I cannot tell a lie. I chopped down a cherry tree or right. throwing a silver dollar across the baton. Most people you kind of roll their eyes at that. But they still kind of believe Lincoln, that Lincoln really did, you know, walk various miles, great distances back, you know, when he was working at a store to return, you know, two cents change or something like that. And um, there's, uh, there's a lot of those stories about him, and people just tend to accept that because he – you know, he's become the uh, the secular saint of our civilization. But I talk about his career as a lawyer too, where he was uh, he was known. You know, my hero Huey Long, who I write a lot about, uh, was famous for saying uh, that he had never taken a, a case against a poor man. I think it could be fairly said that Abraham Lincoln never took a case defending a poor man when he was a lawyer. He was uh, basically known as a corporate type of lawyer in those early days, and he mainly represented the big railroads. So uh, this is, you know, contrary to the image that people have of him. And uh, it, it, it just it simply isn't true. Lincoln was sim simply not, there's nothing in his career that, to say that he was for the little guy. In fact, he, he was for the business interest. And in that time, the powerful interests were the railroads, and he uh, represented them. So he, he was hardly, you know, a man of the people coming from nothing and defending the little guy. All that is contrary to reality. So... Uh, he was already a myth, you know, by the time he got to the White House. And then uh, we can certainly talk about his presidency, but it's uh, fitting that we start here instead of with the founding of the republic because presidency represented, you know, they saw, so call, a lot of people call it the second American Revolution. Well, I think that it, uh, it shattered the first one. And, you know, if you, if you look back to uh, why we became a country, why the founders uh, – fought a war for independence, there were two primary principles they were fighting for. One was, and the most important one, was the consent of the governed. This is a revolutionary concept that every, people everywhere have a right to consent to those that govern them. And they should be able to elect their you know, representatives. And, and they, they were very, very clearly, and you know, this would become important later, 
90 years later when the, the southern states wanted to secede because uh, Jefferson especially uh, you know, said over and over again that any any time the people want to alter or abolish this go the government, they had the right to do it when it no longer fits their needs. So, uh, and the, the consent of the government was very important because clearly in 1860, the southern states no longer consented. So, by by stopping them from leaving the union and trying to keep them in force and killing almost a million men in the process. Uh, Lincoln shattered forever the primary principle behind the American Revolution. That was the consent of the government, because clearly they didn't consent, and he said, there, you have to stay here no matter what. You don't have the right to go form your own government. You have to stay here with us by force. So that was very important, and certainly after uh, the other primary con uh, precept of the revolution, which uh, really became shattered, you know, along the way, kind of piecemeal, and that is no taxation without representation. I think if anybody that looks at our so-called representatives today and, and, and thinks that they represent us is very naive. So the two founding principles of the American Revolution are long gone, but uh, the consent of the government was gone when, when uh, Lee surrendered to Granite Appomattox in 1865 and hasn't been seen since. So when we pay lip service to that. It's ridiculous because that, that war proved one thing. It was that the consent of the government was not a part of uh, the new American government. And uh, the other thing you need to consider is after that war was over, prior to 1860, if you look back when people talk about the United States, they talked about it as plural. The United States are, as they were considering sovereign states. After the war, it became singular, and so today we say the United States is, and it's, you know, it's one giant aggregation of states who really are like Alexander Hamilton uh, envisioned. And Hamilton was really kind of Lincoln's uh, ideological predecessor. If he was the first one early on, he was the one who wanted the strong central government, which Lincoln gave us. You know, with his, 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 he, he built up the bureaucracy. He was the first big government president. He was the first imperial president. And uh, he fulfilled uh, Hamilton's wishes, and Hamilton also wanted the central bank, which, of course, eventually became a concrete reality with the Federal Reserve. But uh, so unfortunately, the people lost um, on, at, at every turn, and uh, the people especially lost. There was a battle between Jefferson's populism, classical liberalism, which I still am a populist and classical liberal, so uh, I, I don't have too many uh, peers in today's world. Nobody seems to want to be a civil libertarian anymore. But uh, unfortunately, that side lost out over the course of history to the, uh, the statist side, uh, the Hamilton side, the Abraham Lincoln side, and later the uh, Woodrow Wilson and FDR, and you know, down to the modern presidents. You know, we'll uh, get get into your you know populism and you know being uh, it, you know really in your own uh, you know political uh, party as, as we go through the show um, in in your book you also bring up um, that Lincoln uh, promoted the Corwin amendment and his uh, work with the know nothing party yeah. Yeah, a, a lot of these um, topics may not really register with a lot of us today, but you know, you know they were pretty big. Uh, you know, the Know Nothing Party was a pretty big movement there in the what, like eight, eighteen, late eighteen forties into eighteen fifties. Yeah, right. um, and can can you explain a little bit about those? And, uh, or at least that uh, party, and uh, we can get into the Corwin sure. Amendment as well. But yeah, you know, I think it, you do uh, really a fantastic job of giving those little details, and you, know, you can see how they progress over time. So, right. Well, that, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, well, you know. Uh, Lincoln, by, by you know, support, of course, he would later kind of deny that he did because the Know Nothing Party looks pretty bad in retrospect now. 
very mm -hmm. bigoted and uh, you know very uh, very anti-Catholic, especially. Uh, the Know Nothings really hated the Catholics, and they were very much associated with the Masons because the Freemasons were very anti-Catholic as well. Of course, you had the the anti-Mason party too that was a little bit before then that was led by John Quincy Adams, the <laughs> former president. So there was a lot of you know things going on there, and you know the Corbin Amendment. You know the the Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln's record on slavery is, again, I examined it, I think, very, it, it showed what a pragmatist he was, that he was willing to, uh, he, he was willing to do anything, basically, as, as he said himself, once he got in office, you know, he had that famous quote, which people parrot, but they don't think about it, you know, and he said, you know, I, I will save the Union, that's what I want to do, if I can save the Union by freeing all the slaves, or none of the slaves, I'll do it, or some of the slaves, so he was telling you, that his main goal was to save the Union, and what he meant by that, that's, you know, he's, that's a nice way of putting it, but he, he should have said enforce the Union, the involuntary Union, because that's what he was doing. And so the only reason that the South today, that the Confederates aren't seen as the plucky underdog they were, uh, because they were vastly outnumbered, and they put up a really good fight against you know, superior forces and superior uh, weaponry for, a, for quite a while. And because they, they basically were better, they had better generals and strategists. I mean, people like Lincoln, I mean, people like Grant and Sherman and Sheridan were just thugs. They, they, had, they had no military strategy at all. They, they were all fighting a war of attrition. That's why Grant's nickname was the Butcher. And uh, Mary Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's wife, was one of his biggest critics. And I've got a great quote from her, it'll be in History 3, where she talked about, you know, his, his entire strategy was to, you know, go out and he didn't care how many men he killed. Because he just figured, well, I'm gonna, we're going to win this because we have a lot more men. And uh, it was a, a, a bloodthirsty and very immoral strategy. And that's why uh, George McClellan, who was the only really Union general that was really skilled, he was a great technician, but uh, he got on Lincoln. Lincoln argued with him constantly because McClellan cared about the lives of his men. And he refused to fight. He was the only one who refused to fight a war of attrition. So, of course, he was the only one Lincoln had a problem with. And, of course, the court historians, and as you know, I use that term a lot, court historians, mm -hmm. uh, they're the ones like, like the mainstream media today. The court historians determine the past. You know, they, 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 they tell us what really happened in the past, much as the, the mainstream media today, you know, tell us inaccurately and lie constantly about what's happening now. They interpret events. The court historians interpret things in the past, and they have, you know, of course, they cast most of the time. They cast the good guys as bad guys and bad guys as good guys. And in this case, uh, they make people, uh, if there is such a thing as a war criminal, or William T. Sherman, Philip Sheridan should be at the absolute top of the list, Grant not too far behind them. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, mm -hmm. somebody like George McClellan was, really had some morals, and uh, because he wouldn't sacrifice his men, Lincoln had said he had a case of slows and said, you're not acting. Well, no, I'm not going to act like that. So um, really it was a... a there's, there's, you know, we'd like to look at it as a cartoonish thing, and all the way through World War II, whatever, we, we get these cartoon, cartoon vi uh, villains, and so Americans, if they think of this at all, they think of these tobacco spitting and drooling uh, racists that are whipping their slaves and mistreating them and raping all the women, and again, nothing can be further from the truth, because keep, keep in mind, these people thought of them, you know, they, they considered them valuable property. We recoil at that idea today. But that's the way they consider them. So they wouldn't. That would. It would not have made sense for them to mistreat them. So that that has been greatly exaggerated as well. And uh, you know they. And I, I. And of course they hate any 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 court historian will bite your head off if you say uh, the war was about. Not only was the war wasn't about slavery, but it, even if they was what, what about more than slavery, they'll go crazy. Oh, that's just. They'll call you a racist for saying that. Well, again, I've got the quotes in the book, you know, that it's, it's, it's not the truth. And there's General Grant's famous quote that said, you know, if I thought I was fighting for slavery, I'd turn my uh, sword in tomorrow. And so, well, you know, the, the North was not fighting for slavery, against slavery. It, it was, it, Don, and, and you do make the point that from the 1860 census that there was only 4.8% of the Southerners owned slaves. Yeah. Yep. It, I mean, it, it was. It was. You know. It, obviously, it was. Uh, it's like it is now. If, if they. Well, of course, if, 
And, and one thing I always, when, when people talk about slavery back then, I, I love to bring up the fact that there are 40 million slaves in the world today. The they establishment tells you 10 million of them are in India. Uh, of course, that's, you know, in India alone, that's like three, th more than three times the amount of, of African-American slaves in America at its peak. So, you know, there's, that, there's three times as many in India today. Where there's no boycott of India. There's no embargo of India. Nobody talks about it at all. I mean, and we've reported enough of their visa workers to take over IT. So alone. But, so it's, it's just not a moral issue. If they cared about slavery, you'd have marches and protests, and people wearing pussy hats going crazy about slavery. They don't. They want to keep talking about the slavery that existed back then because it causes racial division in the country. And they act like that was the only slavery. In fact, slavery existed all over the world. Uh, it was a common thing, unfortunately, but it was. And uh, so America was not unique in that respect. And there was nothing, I mean, slavery is slavery. Obviously, it's a horrible condition. Nobody would want to be a slave. I wouldn't want to be, a, one of the intelligible things Lincoln said is, so I would not be a master. So I would not be a slave. I would not be a master. And, you know, I, I certainly agree with that. I wouldn't be a slave master or a slave. I wouldn't want to be either one. But it, it was unfortunately a normal thing back then, and there was no, there was nothing better or worse about Amer the American form of slavery. There was nothing, as, you know, bar more barbaric in America about slavery than where it exists anywhere else. Because obviously, the slavery, the slavery is barbaric. But people just look at it that way, and uh, they want to believe there was something special, and so they can they can make it a, a, an issue for today's politics, and that's. Uh, that's another thing the court historians do. They look at, uh, they convert all of history into our modern day issues so that they look to back to the prism of the modern day. So they're looking at, especially in our politically correct world, in our woke authoritarian madness. So they're looking back and, you know, I'm, I, I would not be surprised if you didn't start seeing some exposés on, you know, they had transgender units in the Civil War. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Uh, because this is what, you know, they do. They're, re they're rewriting the past. You mentioned 1984 in the introduction mm -hmm. of the show. Yeah. That's what Winston Smith's job was. And this is what they do. They're, they're constantly rewriting the past, creating unpersons. So Thomas Jefferson becomes basically, he goes from the most un enlightened man, maybe in, certainly in the history of America, I think. He was a real Renaissance man, a man of the Enlightenment, uh, one, one of the first great modern classical liberals. And uh, he's turned into this vile racist, and uh, instead Sally Hemings, who was one of his slaves, she gets elevated to status where she's the one we should be analyzing. She's the great historical figure. And it's, a, it's a perversion of reality, and, but it just it shows why we're in the situation we are today. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, whoever, the past is prologue. So when you get the past wrong, as we do, the court historians, I mean, everything they're telling you today, basically, you know, my books show that, my hidden history books show that we've been lied to about everything. So you can't possibly uh, have a, a, a situation in the modern day, in the present day, where you're at a, a you know, a, a, a position of truth. And so that's, that's the, you know, when you're lied to constantly, you can't possibly be, uh, you know, arrive at a, situation where you're living in a in truth in any kind of sense of the word. Okay, well, uh, Dawn, since you, you were just discussing the mainstream media and the court historians um, of today's world, um, it, set the scene for how President Lincoln dealt with the media of you know, the uh, early 1860s. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think the, uh, a lot of the listeners are aware of you know, how uh, harshly he dealt with his, his uh, media critics. Yeah, absolutely. He certainly did. He's... Uh... He, Lincoln shut down over uh, 250 newspapers uh, and he was president. So, I mean, that's, that should astonish everyone. And uh, Lincoln brooked no criticism. Again, he, everything you've heard about Lincoln is exactly contrary to reality. He was, you know, he was called by his enemies. He was called a tyrant. And there's no other word to describe him. He was a tyrant. 
he's the greatest tyrant we've ever had. And, you know, ironically, the court historians tell us the exact opposite, that no, actually he was our greatest statesman, he's the number one president, and all that is just ridiculous. It's contrary to everything he did, but he, he threw uh, he threw some of them in jail. Now, you know, the other thing he did is he, you know, he, he not only uh, basically stopped all, and we, he stopped all uh, his criticism in the press and, and you know, got rid of periodicals he didn't like and shut things down. He had his Union soldiers go out and then arrest these people, and he was arresting everybody. Like, in, you know, not sh shortly after he got in office, he suspended, he suspended the writ of habeas corpus, the first and only time in our history. Uh, the Supreme Court justice at the time, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, wrote, a, wrote a ruling saying, you can't do this, this is unconstitutional. Lincoln threatened to arrest him. Now, he did, he did back off from doing that, but, th you know, that was his impulse. His first sentence was on the locking everybody else. They don't even know because they didn't keep records. They were thrown in. Their families weren't notified. People in the North, I mean, basically, you could be walking down the street, and uh, I give examples in the book. There was... Uh, one guy with some, some kids or something reported somebody for waving a, a shirt that was stained with blueberry juice or some, someone did, it had nothing to do, but somehow this was interpreted as, a, as being in, in, uh, in sympathy with the secessionists. And uh, the guy was thrown in prison. And uh, they, you had books written at the time, American Bastille, things like that, by prominent people who were thrown uh, into these makeshift prisons. They were treated terribly. And uh, they, some of them you know, stayed for a couple of years. And uh, they, they were never charged. There were no charges because the, the writ of habeas corpus was gone. So you did, you did no longer got the right to, to know what charges were against you. You couldn't place bail. And uh, you know, this is a precedent that, uh, that we see today. When you look at the January 6th defendants, uh, very much in the same situation almost exactly that Lincoln's critics were except for uh, Joe Biden didn't suspend, officially suspend the writ of habeas corpus. So, but effectively, it has been suspended for them because they've been held over a year in prison without charges, without bail, uh, solitary confinement, beatings, actually worse, being treated worse than Lincoln prisoners were. But Lincoln set the precedent for that. No other president, you know, Lincoln was the 16th president of the United States. The first uh, 13 presidents, uh, all adhered to the Constitution. None of them overstepped their bounds. James Polk was the first one with the Mexican-American War that uh, started expansionist tendencies, and uh, that was unfortunate, and I, I'm writing a lot about that in History 3, about what he did. Now, Lincoln, hmm. strangely, was a congressman at the time, and he actually opposed what Polk was doing, and he used some of the same language that the South would use when they, when they seceded uh, you know, 15 years later, but uh, Lincoln has forgotten his, uh, what he thought at that time. But uh, other than Polk, the first 15 presidents pretty much stayed, you know, within their constitutional boundaries. Didn't matter if they were Federalists or Democrat Republicans. Uh, but Lincoln was a new breed altogether, and that's why when he when he came in, he had a whole different idea. And this guy, you know, even some of the court historian presidents will say, uh, historians will say. There's, there's, we really don't know that Lincoln thought there was any end to his power. He basically thought he could do whatever he wanted because he was the commander-in-chief and there was a rebellion on him. And again, we see the, what do they call what happened in January 6th, the insurrection. So right. they, they mischaracterize something and they basically uh, you know, excuse anything they want to do, any kind of tyranny, any kind of violation of rights. They just call it a rebellion or an insurrection or whatever. But Lincoln set the precedent because there was no precedent for this before that. And, uh, you know, you, you have even something like uh, Lincoln's uh, precedent was quoted directly by George W. Bush's aide, John Yoo, when uh, they were criticized for torture uh, with the, the prisoners at Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib. Uh, they, he directly quoted Lincoln. He cited him as precedent. So very dangerous precedent. I mean, you, you can see that Lincoln, doing what he did, I mean, uh, he, he had the first draft in the history, the military draft, and if you look back at history, the, the famous New York draft riots were mainly the Irish immigrants who were uh, incensed that a lot of them had just gotten off the boat and they were being forced to, to go fight some war they had nothing to do with. Uh, they didn't even understand the issues, and they naturally were incensed. So, you know, that was a, uh, a huge protest, uh, one of the biggest protests uh, uh, up, to, up to that time in American history. And uh, the, the idea of a draft, again, unconstitutional, nothing in the Constitution where the, 
the government can force you, conscript you into a military service, they can set that precedent. And uh, once, you know, Woodrow Wilson reestablished it with World War I, and he reestablished a lot of other awful stuff, which I go into my books, and then Franklin Roosevelt kind of find it even more, uh, you know, uh, fine-tuned it even more. And the rest is history. All, all the presidents have, you know, they, they, they built on what Lincoln started. Lincoln was the first one coming president. Lincoln was the first one to overstep his bounds and uh, shatter the separation of powers. Because the beauty of our system was that you were supposed to have three equal branches of the government, but they would mm -hmm. check each other, the checks and balances, so that no, none of them got too much power. And I'll, I'm going into it a lot in Hidden History 3, but the judiciary was actually the first branch that ever stepped in under John Marshall, who, again, is considered a great American. I mean, he was not a great American. He, uh, he perverted the court. And Thomas Jefferson, you know, who is now being, you know, cast as a racist, he was the one who saw through it. And the concept of judicial review, which has become, everyone agrees with that. Nobody questions that except for like me, I guess. Uh, Jefferson ran and raved about Marshall's concept of judicial review because basically that, that was not supposed to be part of the Constitution. The Supreme Court wasn't supposed to just be able to rule on everything and say, no, that's not a law, that's a law. That's not. They were supposed to in, in, interpret the this constitutionality of, of things. But uh, they, so they, at, at that time, they became much more powerful than the legislative and the executive. And then when Lincoln became an imperial president, uh, the executive and the judiciary left the legislative branch, which is theoretically the most responsive to the people. Because we can, you know, we can, we can overturn the House if we, we never do, but we could every two years. Uh, but the legislative branch is by far the weakest, and it's because both the other two branches uh, just you know, knock the uh, balance of powers out of whack with their uh, actions. Uh, Don, since you know, we're talking about um, uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court, um, you know, maybe we can back up to the uh, trial of President Lincoln's uh, assassins. Uh, that you know, what you said earlier about uh, you know there might be a, a precedence from that trial that that is being uh, applied to the. Uh, January sixth insurrectionists. Yeah, I mean, I, they, I don't think any. I don't know if they've uh, publicly broached that, but uh, certainly they could. And, and the way they've been treated, uh, again, is very similar to way. Uh, even yeah, you're right. Even the Lincoln conspirators were, were alleged conspirators were treated worse even than the uh, the prisoners that Lincoln had been treated. Critics that had been thrown in these makeshift prisons in the north throughout the course of the war, but. I mean, yeah, that was just unbelievable. They they weren't allowed to testify in their own defense. They were, uh, I described, you know, they uh, that, uh, these they had these hideous heavy hoods, cut of they didn't cut out the holes for eyes. They had like a, a thing where they could breathe, I guess, and and eat. They were they were shackled with irons. They just they were treated like uh, you know uh, something out of the dark ages, the Middle Ages. It was horrendous, and uh, you know, I think there's ironically, I talk about Lincoln being. Uh, the greatest tyrant that we've ever had, but I think there's no question that he was killed by a conspiracy uh, from in his own midst. It was an inside job, to use Alex Jones' uh, expression. And I think Edwin Stanton was probably the mastermind of Secretary of War because he's the one that devised all these uh, medieval-type tortures for the prisoners. And, of course, to the, the real disgrace of everyone in America that was in power at that time, Mary Surratt, became the uh, first woman executed, in, hanged in American history, and uh, she had absolutely nothing to do with anything, any real or imagined conspiracy. She ran a rooming house where Booth, where, uh, Booth rented a room. That's the extent of it. I mean, the, the idea that they hanged that woman, that's, that's, a, that's a blot on our history, even if nothing else had come out of that time. And uh, so I, I go into great detail in the book about why. That was such why that was such an injustice. Yeah, and you would think if there's going to be a fair trial, that John Wilkes Booth's diary would be admitted as evidence. And right. you note that 
there are numerous pages that were that came up missing. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, do, do we know? Uh, is there? Do we know what was on the missing pages? Uh, is there an alibi to some uh, other? incriminating information do do we have it have they ever shown up no no and it's um, again you can speculate what was on them but again it's like it's like all these uh, incidents that i investigate i mean this is typical you know there's always missing evidence uh, there's always missing or suppressed evidence or withheld in this case yeah they the and the the pages missing are you know right the crucial pages you know leading up to the assassination and uh you know, Booth himself said he left that cryptic message on the record saying, I have, uh, and he wrote in his diary that was retrieved after the assassination, and he said uh, something like, I have half a mind to return to Washington, D.C. and clear my name, which I feel I can do. Of course, that's a strange thing for somebody to say who is supposedly identified by everybody in the theater who knew him. Uh, you know, how could he clear his name? I mean, the only way he could possibly have done that, I don't know that he could have his name, but he could have, uh, he could have made it clear who he acted for. I mean, he could have said, "Yeah, you know, Stanton and the uh, you know the rest of the Lincoln administration put me up to this," which I think that's probably what he would have said. Because I think that again, I don't know. That's you know, I think that's where the evidence reasonably leads us to. You know, I mean, you know, a uh, hundred years later, you know, you say the sense of the JFK assassination. We don't know exactly who orchestrated it, but I think we can easily say that it was powerful forces within the government. I think the same thing can be said about Lincoln. Amazing. I, you know, just, um, it's a interesting, what, what you do is an interesting way to show how um, history repeats itself, or you know, get get to the uh, phrase uh, "more things change, the more they stay the same." Right. Mm -hmm. it, it you, know, you just kind of wonder about these uh, if an event is what brings out these. Uh, tyrannical impulses mm -hmm. I, I you know, th th you know those are just some of the ideas that came to mind as you know uh, I was reading uh, uh, about the, you know, um, what you wrote about Mary Surratt you, you know you, you just brought that up I um, you know there was no reason for her to be executed not at all. And that was just really just uh, just viciousness because I don't I don't think Mary Surratt could have said anything that she didn't already say to herself or her daughter. I mean, it's that innocent. I don't think Mary Surratt knew any deep dark secrets that she could reveal. They were just being vicious. And I'm not sure what any of those other defendants knew. Uh, you know, other than maybe Bruce who wasn't there. And uh, but uh, so I think. Uh, it was clearly, there are a lot of elements there to it. You know, there's, there's, I, go, I go into the Lincoln assassination in pretty good depth in this, mm -hmm. um, in the book. And uh, but all you need to know that you begin, and the government, to show you, Mark had committed that the, these, uh, these, 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 the people in power are to the lies, to the, 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 narr the narrative. And I've written about that in my blog and sub, sub stack and so forth. That, but there's there's a narrative, there's an official narrative, an overall narrative, and it's it's been around since that time. Certainly, it's stronger than ever today. But the official narrative is that, uh, and that's why you see people like me and you, you know, demonize this conspiracy theorists because we're questioning the, we're questioning something about the narrative. And it doesn't matter what it is necessarily. It can be 9/11, it can be JFK, it can be going back to the Lincoln assassination, it can be Seth Rich, it could be something new you know, uh, Epstein or something. It, 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 whatever it is, and that's why you have Snopes and all the fact checkers and everything, they're desperate to come out and discredit any questioning of any of these things. There's not one thing that can be questioned because the, the narrative is that those in charge know best. They know everything. It's like, you know, being a little kid and questioning your parents. You know, don't question me. 
you know, do as I say, not as I do. All these things you hear when you're a little kid, you're too, you know, young to understand it. But that's the way they treat the people, and it goes back to even they're they're so committed to the lies and to the narrative and to the smearing they've done of people. You know, since that time, there were there were critics of the Lincoln assassination that said there was more to it than Booth, and they wrote books. And uh, they were, you know, at the time they were smeared. They weren't necessarily called conspiracy theorists because that really didn't come into play until the CIA's 1967 memo countering criticism of the Warren Report. And ever since then, they've never looked back because that's their strategy that they employ in the Mockingbird media. But back then, uh, you know, they, they hadn't, all that hadn't been invented yet. So, uh, but if, if you look again, that this, this, this goes back to that when, when Booth was buried, or supposedly Booth was buried, I, I don't believe he was killed in Garrett's barn. I don't think that was Booth. I think that was uh, someone else, and I, I think that's what the evidence showed, that they just lied and said they caught them. And for whatever reason, that Booth got away and lived to the early 1900s. And somebody else wrote a book about the finest L. Bates, who, uh, by the way, is a direct... Uh, Ancestor of Kathy Bates, who's a pretty big time actress now. <clears throat> oh, yeah, uh, from kind of your Misery. Kid, kid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, curious tidbit. Fine and Water Boy. Bates. Yeah, right, exactly. Her, her great grandfather, whatever he was, uh, was one of the first conspiracy theorists in the Lincoln assassination. So it's kind of a curious tidbit. But um, Booth, whoever was buried at Green Elm Cemetery in Baltimore under the name of John Wilkes Booth, uh, there's been great controversy about it ever since, and, and of course they could have solved the controversies, and they could, could have solved it now, especially in Monterey, because of DNA evidence. And when I was writing the book, I uh, talked several times to Joanna Holm, Holmey, who is, uh, Booth didn't have any children, so she, she, she's like his great, 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 great niece or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she represents the family, and they've been trying to get the body exhumed. For a long time, that typically when these bodies, when anybody wants to exhume a body, it's up to the family. And if the family wants to do it, they pretty much nobody stops it. In this case, the families want it, but the National Park Service won't allow it. Now, why would that be? I think it's pretty obvious because they know or they're scared that that body isn't John Wilson. Because what that what that what does that do? Even now, because really, you know, that, we're talking about something that that happened over 150 years ago. So it shouldn't impact our present politics at all, but it does because you see the domino effect. Because if people say, oh, they lied about that then, because it wasn't good, so it opens up a can of worms and, and these dominoes begin to fall. And I also talked to, you know, I wrote about Meriwether Lewis, the Lewis and Clark expedition, uh-huh. much earlier, you know, 50 years before, whatever, 60 years before. And, uh, he is a claim, they claim he committed suicide. And again, anybody's investigated it, there's not really any evidence he did that. He was almost certainly murdered. His family believes that too. And again, he didn't have any kids either, so I talked to his great, 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 great nephew. And uh, they've been trying to get the body exempt as well. So even something that's even farther than there is our politics, what, you know, what could he, Mary with the Lewis have to do with today's politics? I don't know. But they're so committed to the lies. The court historians are so committed to the narrative that we're always right, and these kooky conspiracy theorists are never right, that they're withholding. They're not the National Park Service is blocking it, so he can't be exempt either. So that's why when we talk about things like today, I mean, they're, they're not about to give up on anything that's meaningful today because they won't even put any ground on something like that. But, you know, you're talking about uh, you know, over 200 years ago in the case of Mary Weather Lewis, and, uh, but they're committed to the lies. And they slandered people for a long time that questioned it and tried to make them look like they were, you know, being sensationalists or they weren't uh, respectful of the families. In this case, the families themselves weren't. So that's how deep these things run. Like, they're not just, you know, covering up Building 7 of 9-11 and the magic bullet with JFK assassination. They, they, they are covering up everything. And they know... The court historians know, and you, you know, if you're chipping away at one little element, it won't land. That could that could cause something else, so they fight it. And uh, believe me, I know. I've talked to some of them, and they just uh, their minds are completely closed. And, and and on the rare occasions when a court historian uh, ventures off the reservation, uh, their their reputation is shattered forever. I and mean, one example of that that I wrote about uh, in uh, the book Crimes and Cover-Ups is um, John Tolman 
author was a Pulitzer Prize. And to win a Pulitzer Prize, you got to be a court historian. You got to be in good grace, in good standing. He won a Pulitzer Prize, I think, for his book on Hitler. And uh, so, yeah, he was a you know brilliant guy, but he pretty much held the line, establishing life. But uh, he started doing some research into Pearl Harbor. And uh, mm-hmm. he decided, wow, you know, the record really shows the FBI knew about this in advance, and it does. So he wrote the book Infamy, uh, early 1981, something like that. And, uh, it, you know, it's it, very controversial, obviously. Uh, he was drunk. He was called a Nazi, which you know, makes no sense at all. He wasn't even talking about the Nazis, but he was called a Nazi. And uh, he was uh, drummed out of the you know, historical community, he, and he ended his... Uh, his remaining years are very sad because the only people that would that he that would give him a chance to speak were the uh, revisionist historians, who were you know tied into Holocaust denial, and, and that's that's where he had to go to get any kind of an audience or a forum, and, uh, and he went from Pulitzer Prize to that, and all because he you know, he he showed demonstrated very clearly the evidence showed that uh, Pearl Harbor was not a sneak attack that you know, FDR might as well have been flying one of the planes himself, and there and so that's. But that's where, you know, so I, I can understand why more court historians don't, uh, you, know, you know, go off the reservation because it's, it's obviously a much better gig, you know, to get, uh, to get tenured at the whatever college you're with and uh, get the great respect of the media and then make a nice salary. And so, you know, who, who wants to be, you know, called a Nazi and then like he was? So it's, uh, I can understand that, but still, you know, you have to, I, I think you have to seek the truth, especially if you're supposed to write about history. Okay, since, since you just brought up uh, you know, the book Infamy, um, you know, let's you know, be fair and balanced and look at uh, President Franklin Roosevelt about uh, you know, 70 years later. Um, he, he, you know, you're saying that uh, he was very much aware of you know the the su- surprise attack on uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, why don't we know that kind of information? Uh, why why isn't uh, <clears throat> you know, public information about uh, you know, Mary Surratt just had uh, it was really at uh, the right place at the wrong time uh, it, why isn't this common knowledge well I think it's what, you know, what I said about the court historians who, and the, who they, they basically work for the the deep state, whatever you want to call it, much as uh, you know, all all our state-controlled media does. It's the same reason you don't know anything about events that happen now. I mean, they they just admitted Hunter Biden, Biden's laptop existed. I was writing stories about that two years ago for the American Free Press. None of that. Said. I mean, every everybody knew it was on this thing. Then, so they, because to acknowledge any of it is to acknowledge because you have out there, you have a group of us out there that are kind of. Uh, I don't know what you would call it. It's like a, not a government in exile, but it's like a media in exile, people like us, because we're doing actual reporting. We're, we, we don't have any, uh, you know, any tenured position at a college. We don't have any kind of a, a, a huge uh, you know, television network that's paying us a million dollars a year to read off a teleprompter. So we, we don't have any of that to, to lose. We're, we're just out there, we're interested in history, we're interested in events, we're, we're trying to tell the truth. So something like Roosevelt, when we, we look at the record and how you know, he, was, he was committed, all his private correspondence proves it. I mean, he, the, the, uh, he was so giddy after the, after the Jap, Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor, even his wife was saying she'd never seen him so excited. I mean, he, was, he was just like he had uh, you know, just been invited to an orgy with you know, 20 supermodels. I mean, he was so excited. And uh, because this is what he had wanted. And uh, Roosevelt, like all the high rent presidents, Wilson and, and, uh, and uh, Lincoln, of course, especially Teddy Roosevelt, these are all 
tremendous war mongers. When you see the ones today, they, and obviously all of them are that are in office now, uh, they just live for war. This excites them, and uh, it's uh, it, it excited him. And uh, as, as most of these guys are, he was a chicken hawk. You know, he didn't serve in World War One, although of course he he, he was gung ho for it. Uh, and so, but that's what most of these guys are. So he, to uh, for whatever reason, they and the and he, they like to pick apart like Jefferson, for instance, and uh, some of the other old dead white racists from the founding fathers. Uh, you know, that's what they called them. Uh, they pick them apart because they were slave owners. But I mean, I and I hid Mr. Story. I had the more of it. You know, you want to talk about racism? With this, I, I have the incredible cover up I have a lot of uh, you know comments from Lincoln on the record that read like something that uh, you know the Grandmaster of the KKK would say. And uh, in, in Roosevelt's case, he he was a, the he led a segregated uh, government. And when he passed uh, the original like Social Security and all those laws, and I I, I have it in Hidden History Three, and people will be able to understand it. They exempted domestic work, and they, they basically domestic, they exempted all of the work that blacks disproportionately were doing, so that they didn't get Social Security, they didn't get a lot of these benefits that everybody else was getting, and uh, it was a really racist policy, if anything is. But he doesn't get you know, he doesn't get criticized for that. Instead, Thomas Jefferson does, you know, and as you see. Uh, the problem with the court historians, they have they have decided who the great presidents were, who the heroes were, and who the villains were. So if you come up with something that says one of the villains had a human side, or even even something that simple that, they, that maybe there was something decent about them, but they don't they will not consider that because they're cartoon. They they are writing the most simplistic history possible. And I I quote I think I quoted in that book. Uh, whereas this court of stories basically said that you know their concept of American history is that Washington uh, founded the country, uh, Lincoln saved the Union, and Roosevelt expanded it to uh, you know to include everyone. And again, he was actually a racist like almost everybody was at the time. But that's their view of history. That's their simplistic view of history. It's down to that level, and they can do it because, you know, I know writing writing history myself is not a lot of great time to be writing it because most Americans are historically illiterate and they're just not interested in it. So they don't, you know, it's it's easy to fool them about the past when not that many people are paying attention, and uh, they certainly haven't studied it. So what could be? I try to tell them. Okay. Oh, I, I was just going to say, do, do you think? Podcasting is a place where more and more people are getting the truth, uh, what they didn't learn in high school. Uh, it, 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 they're just moving away from you know, the obvious staged stuff in the mainstream media. I think so. Yeah, I think it's really this, this, you know, the alternative media consists of podcasts like this, shows like this, uh, all internet radio shows. Um, that's, you know, that's the only kind of medium other than and blogs and, you know, things like mm -hmm. Substack where I write. Uh, yeah. And uh, the, the, there aren't many print media left, like the American Free Press. I write for them regularly. Uh, they were America's last free newspaper. Uh, that's, you know, there, there aren't many, you know, Gerald Salante's Trends Journal is pretty good. I mean, there's um, there are not many things out there, but they're, they're, that's the alternative media. So, yeah, so people that are listening to this show or any of the shows that I appear on or, or my own show, that's where you're going to get the guests that you're not going to get anywhere else. I mean, I, 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 I was on RT television um, a handful of times, and, of course, now they've, they've gotten rid of them. And I was on the Travel Channel once. I was invited on Fox News, Laura Ingram once, but they, they rescinded the offer two hours later with no explanation. I hadn't invited back. So, uh, so I don't really know what was happening. But, uh, and, uh, so, you know, people like me, this is the form. I mean, I, I, I've been on Coast to Coast, you know, AM, which has millions and millions of listeners. That's the biggest form I can get. And I, I'm on there usually a couple times a year. But, um, those in, and that's a, that's an alternative outlet because they, they do let alternative obviously they let me on there they're letting people that are pretty extreme on. 
But that's it. So people that are listening to these shows, um, this is where you're going to have to go to get the information because otherwise you're uh, you're limited to basically Tucker Carlson, who does, who does a pretty good job most of the time on most issues. But that's about it for the you know for the mainstream media and uh, you know television. And most people get their news from television. And there, and, and there is other than like the American Free Press and subscription only things. You're not going to have much. Uh, there's no alternative information, newspapers, or anything anymore. They're just they just all talk the party line. It, 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 Don, you're talking about um, you know, the academics, court historians, or uh, you know, saying who the good presidents are, and they decide. You know, this guy wasn't that that good, based on whatever reason. But um, yeah. You do mention a couple uh, presidents that um, most people don't know a whole lot about. Uh, is John Quincy Adams and Miller Fillmore? Uh, why are they these uh, obscure uh, presidents? It is because they weren't, uh, you know, you had in the, in your book that they weren't, uh, like, pro-Masonic. Uh, you know, is there a, more to it that explains why they've been relegated to, you know, kind of like over in this other category that, you know, we really don't want to talk about? Yeah. Well, you know, Miller Fillmore, I don't know, you know, how much he did beyond what I wrote about him in the book. I, he was, you know, he, so he probably, you know, maybe was forgettable in a lot of ways. But John Quincy Adams was maybe, you know, could be the most brilliant president he ever had. I described his intellectual abilities. He was incredible. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, it, 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 and that was why I was thinking, you know, there, there was the Steven Spielberg movie. But, uh, you know, he has a famous dad. uh but we really don't know a whole lot. You know, he's not featured as much like uh, uh, President Lincoln. Right, right. And Lincoln, of course, is one they're going to they're going to constantly focus on. But they, they, again, this is what the, the historians, the court historians, do. They will pick a handful of people from every era, and that's. That's all. The, that's who they talk about. They don't talk about anybody else. So, and, and with the founders, and I talk about a lot of the people that were important, the James Otis's of the world, people like that that uh, were big in their day. Thomas Paine has been largely forgotten. They wrote Common Sense, mm -hmm. and uh, they basically, you know, we still talk about Washington, obviously, and Benjamin Franklin, um, Adam to some degree, and uh, Jefferson basically to denigrate for the most part. But beyond that, they don't talk about Patrick Henry and those people anymore that were very important. Uh, George Mason, very important, father of the Bill of Rights. Uh, they just don't. I mean, we get to the Civil War, and it, basically there's you know there's a handful of generals. That, you know, they're all demonized now in the Confederate side. When I was a kid, uh, and the Lost Cause thing was still in vogue. You know, I'm in Virginia, so uh, you know people. Are, I mean, half the state is named after Robert E. Lee, so they're going to rename all the states, roads, and schools. Uh, they're gonna have a hard time because there's a Lee Holloway and Lee there's just you know tons of stuff named after him, and uh, so these were heroes, you know Lee and Jackson and Stewart. Those are the three main ones that you heard about, Jefferson mm -hmm. Davis, and uh, of course you know on the other side you heard about you know there's not as much named in my state after Lincoln and Sherman and uh, Sherman and all that thing. But those are basically going up, of course. Those are basically the ones you. Uh, you hear about they distill it to that. So I mean, I I try to when I'm writing history, I try to focus on some of the personalities that were big in their era or did some important things or horrible things. I mean, I've glossed over it for that. I mean, but, but I don't know. I mean, I I get good feedback from people that read it, but I I realize when I'm writing, I'm not writing to the masses because most people this is over their heads because they're not that interested in history and it's just a bunch of names and dates that. Uh, they would probably not rather not know. Okay, and, and 
as we um, keep looking at developing some of these um, themes of history repeating itself, um, you, you do get into the Biddle list from the uh, Franklin Roosevelt administration uh, that was an enemy's list was also brought up uh, during the uh, Nixon administration as well. Can, can you give us a little background on these uh, how these lists were compiled and who was on them, you know, a little history about uh, Mr. Biddle. Well, I mean, Francis Biddle was the, uh, you know, the Attorney General at the time under Roosevelt, but that was, uh, again, this is this builds upon the precedent that Lincoln started, because Lincoln didn't really need an enemy's list. He, he just threw all his perceived enemies in jail. So you know, that, that was basically, and, and you know, uh, got rid of their newspapers if they were his enemies. Um, Wilson, you know, built on that. He threw his, you know, the, the World War One uh, protesters in prison. He revived the Alien Sedition Acts, uh, which were under John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. You know, roundly criticized. He revived them, and then uh, FDR, you know, again took the enemies thing to the extent he had the Biddle's list, which is, if you Biddle's list is. Uh, you look at Nixon, most people, maybe not now, because again, people don't know history at all, but back when I was young, that was a big thing. Nixon's enemies list. They had like Jane Fonda and some actors and stuff on it. Was a, mm-hmm. I think it was 20-some people, and it was nothing. Biddle's list was much bigger, much more important. And of course, then you come to Barack Obama. Barack Obama had a kill list. And uh, nice. nobody talked about it. And nobody cared. They still talked about enemies, you know, in Nixon's enemies list. It's like, what? I mean, Nixon's list was nothing compared to them. But again, all of these things were uh, they were possible because you know Lincoln set the precedent, and uh, because they won the war, his side won the war. If the, if the North had lost, uh, then a whole different story. You know, if, if, if the thing I mentioned many times in that book, and I talk about all the time, is that you know we always need to remember history is written by the victors. So keep in mind that you know that, uh, the people that are writing this history about the Civil War or anything else, the, the people that are there to write it are, are you know are, are working for and were hired by the people that uh, that uh, yeah that, that won. So you know we need, we need to remember that. Yeah, um, I'm sure pro- most people. Listening now, or or who will be on the archives, have probably seen um, the Godfather trilogy. <laughs> but it, you know, you you work in uh, how uh, much pre- President Franklin Roosevelt wanted to uh, have a connection to the mafia. Well, he, he used the, uh, you know, again, this is, it, it, I, I think we should be happy that people like Frank Costello and Lucky Luciano, these people were associated with, they helped the, uh, the allies. You know, Luci, Luciano wanted to go over into Italy and, you know, lead, <laughs> lead the troops himself, which is, uh, I don't think that would have been a great idea, but again, is that, do we have the moral high ground when we're using, you know, organized crime kingpins, and that's, uh, that's what we did, but because they had built up the Nazis, especially, and Hitler especially, into the ultimate of all the boogeymen, you know, H.L. Mencken, one of the great liberals of, of his era, we don't have them anymore, he talked about, you know, practical politics being nothing more than an endless series of hobgoblins, and uh, I talk about that all the time, so we've had hobgoblins since, you know, the Confederates and, and during the Civil War, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the dreaded Hun during World War One and the Krauts, you know, or whatever they wanted to smear them as, and then, uh, you know, Hitler was the biggest, the really sneaky, rotten Japs, and then Hitler it, it was the biggest one of all, and, you know, since then we've had, you know, Castro and uh, uh, Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden, 
uh, Qaddafi, Noriega, I mean, endless. There's now, of course, you have Putin, who's the latest hobgoblin. And these are these are all, you know, things that distract uh, from the problems that America you know, we have domestically. In fact, take the takes the attention of the people away from the corruption of those in charge of and the fact that they're never held accountable for their corruption and their crimes. <laughs> the Hillary Clintons and all these other people are, are, are walking free, you know, and that, they, they, that's, but no, we've got to do with Putin. Look, look, look what Putin's doing. Look at the, and it, you know, it started way back then, but they reached a crescendo uh, with Hitler. And so all was fair in love and one more, you know, and so especially to see this you know, unprecedented demon you know, it wasn't even human, you know, the way they built it up. Um, so uh, you you go, okay, we had to use, you know, Lucky Luciano and Frank and so, yeah, sure, we used the mob, but we, you know, we had to defeat Hitler. So it, anything would have been fine. They could have used serial killers, anything, and, and it wouldn't have mattered because they had demonized the, the Nazis, especially to such an extent where people would have accepted anything. <laughs> uh, it, Jack it, the Ripper. <laughs> it, oh, Right, but it, it, it's just really interesting to to read that information to show you, how, you, know, you know, literally, you know, politics makes strange bedfellows, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, uh, there it is. You know, it's maybe kind of hinted at in uh, The Godfather, but, you know, it's all, all the same time period. There's... You know, you, know, you ha have it uh, that theme developed more in uh, part two with uh, the government and uh, uh, the, you know the mafia working in in unison or is attempted uh, to be pulled off. But uh, yeah, you, you, know, you yeah, there, uh, there it is. You know, that all, all that was not the uh, you know, just fanciful writings of uh, Francis Ford Coppola and Mario Puzo. <laughs> there, there, there it is. So right there, part of American history. I think that's one of the you know. Uh, D delightful aspects of your book is learning all most of these things that you aren't going to get in high school. Right. No, you're not, not going to get exactly. I mean, you're not going to get you know the, whatever history they teach in high school is so. And you know, even back when I was in high school, man, it was never enough for me even though I really didn't understand how much they were lying to us, I just loved history. So I wanted to hear more about the founding fathers, but they weren't feeding us enough back then. Now I'm sure that the only thing they teach is how they were racist, and they probably talk about Sally Hemings a lot, and uh, that's it. You know, they don't talk about them. They can't really, you know, that's the thing about it. If you, just, if you read the, the Declaration of Independence, it reads like a subversive document now. And uh, certainly the Bill of Rights, and uh, the vast majority, we, we know our leaders, and I've written a lot about this, and you know, they, they all swear to uphold the Constitution. They don't remotely believe it. They don't support it. They certainly don't support the Bill of Rights. I mean, everything they do, they don't. They show they don't believe in free speech. So, uh, you know, it's they can't really talk to him. And I, I've commented, I commented in that book as well. How I'm a big Hollywood guy. You know, my latest book's about showbiz. But, uh, I, you know, I'm amazed when I go back and look at the history of Hollywood that even during its most patriotic period, uh, there's never been a, a, a biopic about George Washington, or Thomas Jefferson, or Benjamin Franklin, ever. Patrick Henry, Tom Sager, they, they've never made a picture. Hollywood stayed away from that subject because they knew that even back then, you're talking about the World War One, World War Two area. The, 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 you know, the area, the era of authoritarianism was already creeping in. So, and it didn't fit in with the history of a rebellion, of people trying to throw off the yoke of oppression and, and being against tyranny, and the consent of the governed. All that was contradicted by what was going on in World War One and World War Two, and the, the presidents we had, and the politicians we had. Um, so they can't currently today. I mean, just you know. Uh, you know, something like, uh, you know, when the, when the uh, 
the right winger started the Tea Party movement a while back. That was denigrated, mm -hmm. but basically because of the name. Because the Tea Party, you know, brought back memories of, oh, wow, you know, this is, you know, this is the angry colonists, you know. They're, <laughs> they're almost certainly racist, you know. So, was tea into the, so they don't want any reminder of that time period because it contradicts everything we see about the world today. I mean, today, today's all compliance. You know, you know, obey orders, put your mask on, you know, uh, get your vaccine, uh, wave your Ukrainian for, uh, I stand with Ukraine. Uh, that's what it is, is obey the orders. It's nothing, there's nothing about, you know, liberty and say, you know, leave me alone and uh, I don't agree with that. I mean, that's, that's a foreign concept in today's America. And so they have to stay away from the, the the founding fathers, the era of our birth, as much as they possibly can, because they don't want the people getting any ideas. <laughs> okay, well, okay. So, since you know, you're saying the founding fathers are so scary, you know, they're a threat to. Uh, yeah, you know, the global reset efforts, and uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, they put um, information in the Constitution about dealing with uh, money, how, how you know, was, you know, to uh, yeah. be made, uh, and. Of uh, what, hundred and uh, what, twenty, thirty years after the adoption mm -hmm. of yeah. the the Constitution, and you know, uh, starting with the, the you know the Bill of Rights, you know, we get the creation of the Fed. Uh, mm -hmm. You argue it's a totally unconstitutional private industry. Uh, I'm one of the people you mentioned in your book that doesn't have a really good understanding of it. Yeah, yeah, that, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, that's that's me. Uh, other than, yeah, you know, I've learned a little bit about it from the X Files, but yeah, you know, the X Files is some pretty accurate history. Um, so. Uh, can you elucidate on what the Fed is, how it's unconstitutional, uh, how it came into being, you know, what role it is serving of, of over, what, 109 years or so uh, later in our yeah. world today? Well, it's... Um and the Fed goes back to, uh, again, the, uh, shortly after the uh, Republic was formed, uh, you had people like Jefferson who were dead set against any kind of central bank, and you had people like Hamilton, who, uh, and Hamiltonians won. You know, they created uh, the first national bank and had a charter of 20-some years or whatever, and then I think uh, Madison was forced to renew it during the War of 1812. And then uh, for the next, uh, when it came up for renewal, Andrew Jackson was president. Andrew Jackson was the second great foe of the bank uh, after Jefferson, and he refused to renew it. And uh, eventually, uh, you know, they had, they had these battles for the bank, and this is constantly going on. And the National Bank and, and bankers and the Hamiltonians won for good in 1913 when they passed the Federal Reserve Act, and of course it's, I, I like to make it simple for people because it's complex, but you, you can know two things about it to show you how dishonest it is and, and the problem. One is the name. Federal, it's nothing federal about it. It's not an agency. It's a private corporation. And it was formed by uh, the big banks. You know, there was a uh, Rockefeller descendant there and uh, Baruch and uh, uh, you know, Warburg, all these people. You know, Albert Einstein's buddy, Paul Warburg, was there, by the way. Uh, another great hero, just not a hero. But uh, they were at the founding of the, of the, of the Federal Reserve. But the, the Federal Reserve is based on a, a series of Federal Reserve banks all over the country. And basically every bank in America uh, belongs to the Federal Reserve system. And they are all it's all based upon a fractional 
it's fractional banking, fractional banking system. And the idea was that uh, you could make a loan. You only had to have, it, at first it was 10% fractional reserve. So you only had to have 10% of the money in, in the bank. Let's say you want to loan for, a, I want to buy a house for $100,000. Know. Not thinking of that now, but let's say you do that. Well, the bank can, uh, the bank can lend me the money for that as long as it has $10,000 in reserves, one-tenth of that, 10%. Uh, and then, so where does that 90000 come from? So this is the problem, why it's, why it's, it's, it's legalized counterfeiting, because 90% of every loan created for many decades came out of nothing. It was created in a, in a bank ledger. It doesn't exist. It's not backed by it. Roosevelt took us out the gold standards. Or, you know, and, so it wasn't, there's nothing to back it up. It's funny money. And uh, so, you know, I for a long time said that every, anybody, everybody in prison for counterfeiting should be, uh, should be released because they're in there for doing nothing more than what every bank does every day with every loan they, they create. And just imagine if you had the power, if you, you know, your friend comes up to you and says, hey, you know, can, can I borrow 100 bucks? Sure. And you, uh, you, you write them a check for 100 bucks even though they only have $10 in the bank. And then you charge an interest on the, the imaginary principal in, and that's what they do. They charge interest, which, of course, comes out of nowhere as well. But now, I think Ron Paul in recent years has said that they don't even have the 10% commitment anymore. Now, fractional, you don't have to have any. It's not fractional. I guess it's just imaginary. So now every loan is created 100% on the thin air. So the principal comes from nothing. The interest comes from nothing. So that's why a lot of us have been talking back since the 80s and the 90s. We talked about what they call the upward spike or the economic spike and the collapse that was going to happen. And in the 90s, you had the dot-com boom, which no one foresaw, and that kind of kept things afloat for a while. But I don't know how, you know, the economy, our financial system is on life support because it's, it's based on imaginary money that's not backed by anything. So if you wanted to pull the loans in, they couldn't because the money's not, there's not enough money anywhere here in existence to, to pay it off. But I say, you know, when people talk about you know foreclosures or default, you know if if the bank if a bank lends you something and they get one payment out of you, they're coming out ahead. So it's it's disgraceful that most people still talk about people being deadbeats. No, what are you talking about? The deadbeats are the people that lend money they don't have because they're allowed to legally. So that's the system we have, and that's why uh, they fight tooth and nail. So you know people like uh, Elizabeth Warren, you know the great foe of the bankers, but she voted against auditing the Fed. That's not, so they haven't even audited, done a full audit. They did a partial audit of the Fed, maybe five, six years ago, thanks to uh, Rand Paul and I think Bernie Sanders on the coalition. And uh, mm -hmm. they discovered tr trillions in there that were had been built for foreign governments and things like that. So who who could tell what a real audit of the Fed would show? But uh, the Fed needs to be abolished. We need to have an honest money system. But the problem, it's so because with all this counterfeit money in circulation, how do you, I mean, that's a huge problem. I don't even know how you fix it. But uh, but you try to tell people, and they they, they don't believe you because they can't believe it. You know, they, you know, what do you mean banks are lending out money they don't have? It's counterfeit. That's what it is. And that's as, as simple as I can make it. But uh, I realize most people don't believe it, and they just give you like, you know, <laughs> what are you talking about? They don't believe you. But it's true. Believe me, it's true. Um. Okay, so, since uh, you know, we were talk, talking about uh, some of the people, founders of the Fed, um, some of your uh, uh, parts of your uh, crimes and cover-ups is about some of the people behind the events and... You go into that with the uh, War of 1812. So put that into perspective for us as, you know, you know we move from the Revolutionary War to uh, you know, the early stages of the Republic. Well, you know, and, and we mentioned earlier the French Revolution. And again, it's so the conspiracy thing, that's what he was saying. It's hard to document these things. Uh, they claim the Rothschilds, uh, you know, supposedly, uh, you know, basically it was their war. They have quotes on the record. I think I quoted some, an article in Business Insider. So there's, there's something to it that they wanted this war. And, 
And that was the first process of financing both sides as well. That happened in the Civil War as well. We had people in the finance, both the Confederate and the, uh, the Union side. But uh, the War of 1812 was important to America. It's really the only time in our history, because I don't count Pearl Harbor, because I don't think that was a sneak attack. I think that was contrived. It was a false flag. But American shores were, now that's one war I would have supported the War of 1812, because it was a war of defense. The British did invade and attack us. So you have, you, know, you have to fight a war of defense. So uh, that was really the last just war in my, in my mind that America has ever fought. And um, we can, you know, burn the White House. I mean, you, really, you have to protect the homeland, really protect it, not the fake stuff we're talking about now. But um, And really, I, I'm not sure even what the issues were then. Again, it's, it's like most of the wars, they, uh, you know, they, they were the British just bitter because they lost, you know, the last time. I, you know, I don't know, maybe they thought they could go and finally you know, beat back the, the little plucky colonists. I'm not sure, but uh, it was... Um, Really, you know, it, 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 it kind of, again, laid the, uh, the, the exposed, the inconvenience, the, the, the people that were against it before were kind of all over the place, where uh, some you would expect it before, and some you'd expect it against it. But, again, I uh, I think that, uh, and, and the, 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 some, the National Bank was, was tied to that as well, because uh, Madison basically was, he was a protege of Jefferson, and he, uh, he was pretty much pressured into having to you know, to do it to finance the war. So, you know, people can say, well, did the Rothschilds or, or whoever get behind it just so they could, you know, have the National Bank? I don't know. They started, you know, with World War One. they started wars for <laughs> for, for uh, more unclear reasons than that. So uh, they just love war. It's very profitable for them. And, uh, you know, they never looked back once they did that. You had know, the Mexican-American War and the Polk in the 1840s, which, again, no just reason for it. I mean, we just you know, took land from that was Mexico's, and uh, so you have crazy radical groups today that hate America, like La Raza, but they have a point because we did take their land. And uh, you know, and of course, the Civil War. I mean, you just go to all these. In 1898, you know, the Spanish American War. I mean, they, they, you know, most of them precipitated by false flags and. Uh, it's just been an ugly history. I think someone has tabulated that America has been a Ninety some percent of the of the time since they were founded as a nation. Yeah, um, Don. That's uh, yeah, some interesting lead into the Washington Irving show in, in a couple weeks, and you know, talk, you know, just talking about the. Uh, with the uh, Mexican uh, American War uh, taking just taking the land and saying it's you know now part of uh, Texas or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but you, know, you also have uh, you know the Aaron Burr's attempt to do something like that as well. Uh, mm -hmm. to set up his own republic, and, you know, and Washington Irving was there to, you know, that's you know, a little preview for the listeners, but it, you know, you know, in that early part of the 19th century, it, 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 it's really interesting to look at all, all these ide philosophies and ideas of forming your own government out of, you know, like the southwestern uh, states. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, before I answer, can, can I, do okay, you mind if I have a quick drink of water? Oh, sure. Uh, okay. Uh, go, I'll, I'll be, I'll be go, right Go there. right ahead. Uh, 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 Barbara, how, how, how are you? I've, I've, run out of paper to take, I've run out of paper to take notes on, actually. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, we're, we're uh, setting the stage for some of the uh, early uh, young adult um, 
uh, I information uh, fr from Washington uh, Irving's life that's going to come up. And, and I think Dawn's just doing such a great example of all uh, well, yeah. you know, yeah, what I'm fascinated, what, I, what I've been fascinated with is is the presidents that that you know we we can name, but we don't know much about, and then mm -hmm. suddenly he's giving us information on some of them, and um, of course I knew about Sally Hemings, but but you know a lot of the other ones I haven't. So it was it's been very it's going to send me back to the. Uh, back to the textbooks to find out a little bit more about the presidents that uh, I thought I knew but mm -hmm. didn't. Yeah, no, uh, uh, and that that's what where Dawn excels as a history writer, and you know I think he does a great job and job yeah. and. Sorry about that. I'm back. Okay, that's great. You know, we we're just. Uh, you know, get, giving, giving you kudos. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, but, <laughs> but it, it yeah, it, it'll, it'll probably be fact checked. Uh, you know, uh, so I, I don't know that that will be deleted or not. But uh, um, yeah, I think what you've been discussing. Uh, uh, yeah, d does take us is going to you know be a um, really good foundation for the Washington Irving show and him growing up during this time and you know these presidents working with uh, under presidents Jackson and Tyler um, and. Yeah. You know the War of eighteen twelve. You know so some of these e events that you, you've been discussing are going uh, in such a lively manner are going to uh, you know make for a terrific show with uh, Brian in a couple weeks. So I, you know, I'm just very appreciative of all that you've been revealing to the listeners tonight. Um, okay. One of the topics you discuss that we uh, really haven't brought up, even though it's kind of a local event uh, for me, is um, the Whiskey Rebellion. Sure. What, what's the background uh, story, or, or you know, what's your take on the Whiskey Rebellion? Well, Whiskey Rebellion and Shay's Rebellion, both very similar. They... Uh... They remind us, you know, when I get to, you know, because I have a tendency to worship the founding fathers. You know? I have stars in my eyes for the founding fathers since I was a kid. And, uh, you know, I just I just do. I don't know, whatever. I was drawn to them, and uh, to me, they're ideal heroes. But whenever I get too much you know, down that road, uh, I, I think of the Whiskey That's why I wrote about it. And uh, the Whiskey Rebellion was basically, you know, they had a point. And you know, keep in mind, that whether it was Shays Rebellion, led by, you know, Daniel Shays, who was a soldier in the Revolutionary War, and uh, the Whiskey Rebellion as well was led mostly by people, men who had served in the, uh, you know, in the War for Independence, and they were disenchanted because here they had fought a war that was, uh, you know, they were told a lot of it had to do with the fact that they didn't want unfair taxation, their taxation with their representation. So that's why they served the tea, you know, in the Boston Harbor, in the Boston Tea Party. But here you had, uh, and, you know, Maybe they were, but you know, you could, really you could say that if they were, if they went overboard by uh, going uh, crazy over a tax on whiskey, which is what they did, uh, it's really no different than the, the tax increases on uh, tea and stamps, you know, that, that set off the, the war for independence. So I think they had a point that uh, this is really kind of a uh, a betrayal of uh, what what they fought for. 
And that's what they thought anyhow. And uh, disproportionately on, on a particular group, and they were incensed about it. And uh, so, you know, I, I, can, I, can, I sympathize with them. And I'm sorry that uh, George Washington, you know, crushed it, you know, with a with military force. And uh, I think that's, you know, that was, um, he, he had a lot of great things about him, but I think that was a black mark against him, the way he handled the whiskey regard. I, I enjoy your libertarian, civil libertarian philosophy. Um, how does your family and friends uh, react to your um, unwillingness to go along with the program? <laughs> uh, well, I'm not exactly, I've never been, well, you know, I can't say. I used to be a popular party, necessarily at family gatherings. Um, so I, I, uh, I joke now, especially when we talk about awake and asleep, that I, I have a big family, and a uh, big extended family, and the only person in my family that's awake besides me that's basically standing behind me is my son. He's really awake. No one else is. And, uh, you know, they're, I mean, they tolerate me, my wife and my daughter tolerate me, but, I mean, uh, I think that, uh, some of my nieces and nephews have canceled me, yeah, literally. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's... It is what it is. I mean, you know, it's my, my family is like any other. You know, people say, well, you think, you, no, it's, it's not easy to wake people up. I found, you know, I can't wake my flesh and blood up for the most part. And uh, so it's, uh, people want to believe the narrative. You say, you know, my, my unwillingness to go along with the program. They want to believe the program. They want to believe the narrative because uh, it, it, it makes their lives easier. You know, it's, it's 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 no fun to be going it's like to be the only one in the room pointing out something that the emperor's not wearing new clothes, um, which is what I do basically all the time. And uh, so you know, why can't you? Why do you be such a troublemaker? Why do you be such a rabble rouser? You know, I, I was called a rabble rouser from the time I was young. You know, that's I just you know, I noticed things and I pointed them out. And uh, most people, especially now, you know, when the country's so divided, they. Uh, they don't want to hear any uh, talk, or, you know, uh, going against the narrative that they're hearing because they're 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 swallowing what they're hearing from state run TV, and so somebody's talking about you know the COVID narrative or the vaccines, they don't want to hear that. So, uh, you no, know, unfortunately, I was I, you know I, I thought I thought maybe I'd done a better job, you know, because what I what I'm doing here on a radio and everything now is no different, and I guess that's why. That, they told me, they're my son, I, they, maybe, they, they, maybe they listen in, in secret and won't tell me, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing, which wouldn't surprise me, it's, it's nothing different than what they heard for years, and barbecues, and Christmas, and Thanksgiving, and because that's, you know, I would always expound on things, you know, I would just, you know, things would come up, and, you know, here I am, you know, I'm going to give my take, and, you know, everybody's just, I, I thought maybe, you know, that some of them agreed with me. I guess I must not have been as influential as I thought I was. <laughs> um, you know, so, uh, you, you're doing really well with all, all your podcasts and you know being a guest on so many shows. Um, you're working on... Uh, the hidden history book. What what else do you have going on? Well, I write. I write you know, people they can find my. I, I write regularly for Substack now. I found out a way to make a little bit of money doing it. So, uh, if you go to Substack.com, I actually go to Donald Donald Jeffries dot media. Uh, that's where my Substack writings are, and I've gotten good though. Good feedback. I have a lot of subscribers. There's a pay option now, so some people have become paid subscribers, so I get a lot of money from that. But uh, Substack's a great free speech forum. I mean, Glenn Greenwald is probably the biggest name over there. But, um, you know, obviously I'm honored to be uh, in his presence. He's one of the, the few voices on the left that's uh, sane and solicitable opinion, not many of us left. Uh, but people can find me there. I write to the American Free Press. Regularly, I usually have three stories in every issue, and it comes out every other week. 
that's another way, you know, that's, basically that's the money I make, you know, it's, it's not very much. You know, I tell people I'm living out my dream, but I'm getting paid like a McDonald's worker for it. But uh, so it's, it's a good thing I had something to fall back on, because I'm, <laughs> but I'm doing exactly what I always wanted to do. And uh, my books, you know, they, you know, it, they, it, it's gratifying. I have six books out now, and uh, it's it's nice. But you know, again, they don't they don't give you much of a royalty rate. And uh, you know, Hidden History has sold it very well. But uh, Crime to Cover Ups has done pretty good too. But the other three, you know, kind of lag behind. And uh, so I don't get a whole lot of money from that. And uh, so you know, I need. I need people to support me anywhere they can, and they're, they're starting to do that in some stack. So, uh, and also, I have Donald Jeffries got news with my blog. I've been writing that. If people are really interested, they can uh, they can go over there and start writing that for many years. So the archives there, uh, they might give you entertainment for a, you know a few days or something if you go there and read all the things I've written about. Because I've written about, and I, have, I also have bonus chapters from all. Uh, I think three of my books, I have bonus chapters over there that uh, weren't included in the published version, so you can read those over there. So uh, there's lots of places to, to find me out there if you do search. So, it, so what got you interested in being on this uh, a historian looking at um, digging deeper into history than what you know the general uh, information that we're given while we're in school. What was the well, impetus to? Well, as I said, I you know I, I always loved history as a kid. And I especially mm -hmm. love the American, the American Revolution. I, American history, well, I love the English, too, because I was always writing. So basically, I was asleep in school outside of uh, English and uh, history. American history, I didn't care that much about world history. The US, you know, American history, I loved. So I was, you know, I just, it, just something about it thrilled me. I used to love to go to Smithsonian, to, you know, live in the D.C. suburbs. So I used to love going and looking at you know, George Washington's camp and what the Jersey and Mount Vernon, things like that. I, I loved uh, that stuff from the time I was young. And then, you know, the Kennedy, JFK was killed when I was seven. And that was one of the most, uh, had a huge impact on me. Uh, just, you know, significant event, you know, our family crushed, the Catholic family, and everybody crying and watching nonstop TV. And uh, it just had, a, you know, it was, it, it, something, you know, a spark was lit in me. And of course, it was, you know, that's when I started down these rabbit holes. I mean, when I was in the history of a kid, I was just enjoying it for the sake of history. But uh, it wasn't until I started researching the JFK assassination as a teenager that I realized, wow, oh, there's more to it than this. And I realized what a big lie that was. And, uh, you know, that's been an obsession for me ever since. And it led me uh, to open other doors and down other rabbit holes. So, you know, from there it was you know, Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy and then, uh, you know, the scandals that I, you know, I wrote about in the first hidden history. You know, I, I documented, that was basically the first hidden history is basically a timeline of my life, as far as politically, because it starts with the JFK assassination and it ran up through the Obama years, so, and that's when it was published. But uh, so it covers everything in there: 911, Waco, Oklahoma City, uh, all that stuff. That uh, you know, so people uh, can, you know, that's been my by far my most popular book, and. Uh, you no, know, it's just something I've never, you know, and then when I read Crimes and Cover Up, the book we're talking about now, that was kind of a prequel. It should have been called Hidden History too, but for some reason the publisher didn't like that name. So uh, it's, but it's basically the prequel to that, and, and it, so it's uh, from the founding of the Republic up, up until, you know, right before the JFK assassination. So, but uh, I have, you know, they, they tell you when you're a writer you should write about what you love and you know, what interests you, and I do. I can't. I, can't, I don't think I can write about stuff that doesn't interest me. So everything I write about, my book on shaving, about bullying in school, bully accuracy, all that, these are subjects that interest me. So uh, I, I, you know, it's a labor of love. Okay. And another, uh, you know, we have uh, about 20 minutes left. You know, we can probably uh, just touch on bullyocracy. Um, 
and it, it, there's a, a tie-in with the uh, tyrants, authoritarian figures <laughs> that, that we looked at. You know, several examples from cr- cr- your crimes and cover-ups. It, it, that same type of uh, mentality is basically encouraged in uh, our schools today. Uh, what what did you observe, you know, from your experiences as well as you uh, going into the schools uh, and you know, ha- having a jo- uh, volunteer position in the schools, you know, uh, what what did you see that uh, gave you uh, ideas for writing bullyocracy? Well, you know, I always was, uh, I was aware when I was in school, I was aware of the social hierarchy. And, uh, again, I approach this subject like no one else ever has. And uh, that is that, uh, that they, you know, that's the subtitle, how the social hierarchy that was bullies to rule schools, workplaces, and society at large. Uh, and so by the whole social hierarchy, I mean basically the popular versus unpopular thing. So that, you know, there's a caste system in every school. And anybody that's been to high school, so it starts in middle school, but it's, it's in high school. And uh, everybody knows that it's, it's – uh, if you go to any any if you ask any kid in any high school, they're going to be able to name certain kids that are the most popular, and uh, they're they're in effect uh, the celebrities in the school. They're famous in that little environment, big fish in a little pond. And uh, I contend that this this concept of because you can't have popularity if you don't have unpopularity. So there has to be a yin to the yang. There has to be a contrast. So on the other end of the spectrum, you have the poor trench coat mafia kinds of people who uh, are picked on. You know, the goths, the geeks, whatever you want to call them, the, the people that are, you know, walking around with their pencil protectors and, 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 and uh, the scotch tape holding their glasses to the nerds, right. So uh, they have to exist. Otherwise, there's nothing to contrast the popular people to. So, um, I contend that this is this is wrong and this enables bullying. And, and uh, recent studies have shown what I thought for years that they, they finally admitted that no, it isn't. The bullies aren't the ones from the wrong side of the tracks whose dads are beating them up every night and they're taking their hostility out on other kids. I mean that may happen here and there, but for the, by and large, the studies show that the, the popular the popular kids are the ones doing the bullying, especially the females, the mean girls. 100% popular. No, you know, no non-popular girl is a bully. It just doesn't happen. And, uh, and they're enabled by, it's almost like they feel they have to do this. It's like part of their job description or something, that they have to bully the, you know, the unpopular kids. And the system lets it happen. And uh, most of the time, it's just annoying. But a lot of the time, it leaves scars. And I, you know, I talk about that. You know, I talk to several parents whose kids kill themselves. Bully side. You know, because of this, and uh, that should never happen. And we ought to all be mortified that it has ever happened, let alone as many times it has. And some of these kids are in elementary school. Uh, it's disgraceful. And I, you know, I give probably too many case studies. I mean, people have told me it's overwhelming. I'm so depressed, you know, afterwards. But it, it is what it is, you know. I actually edited some stuff out. But uh, it, it's, it's case after case. And you see the patterns, the same patterns over and over again where the uh, – the, the kids uh, either report the bullying to their teachers or maybe even their principals themselves or they tell their parents and the parents go to the schools. happens over and over again, and nothing, they don't address it, and uh, sometimes tragedy results from it. And then even after that happens, the schools don't take responsibility. They don't say, oh, we screwed up. No. In fact, they say, well, you didn't tell us when, you know, many times they've been to meetings, documented meetings with them, you know, many, many times. Um, so this should never happen, and I, I think that, uh, you know, I didn't know when I wrote Bullyocracy that the schools are going to come under such scrutiny with the pandemic coming up, but um, now that people are seeing some of the people, especially the teachers, and they just go to TikTok or Instagram, and you see some of these, some of these uh, you know, clowns, frankly, 
that are teaching our children. And you see the school boards, you know, I live right in you know, the epicenter of the school board protest in Robin County, Virginia. I used to work there. It's my neighboring county. I'm in Fairfax County. But, wow. Uh, you know, and that's where most of the, the, the you know, the exciting confrontations have been, uh, these petty tyrants on the school boards. But people are seeing what kind of people are in charge of these schools. And again, the breakdown in the country, the, the people that are awake are, are horrified at this. And they want to get their kids as far away from these schools as they can. Uh, but the people that are sleeping, you know, they're still believing, yeah, it's okay, political history is okay, you know. Uh, you know, uh, binary genders, pick your personal pronouns, all that's cool, no problem, you know. Don't worry about learning anything, but, you know, we're going to indoctrinate them. And, but this is all part, it's an outgrowth of uh, what I talked about in Bullyacity, because basically what I documented was this kind of incompetence and corruption uh, with teachers, principals, superintendents, uh, local media, the media covers up these cases. It, 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 I show up and over again how the media in every instance sides with the bully instead of the, although they claim they're against bullying, they always side with the bully. And uh, same thing with the local police. Most cases, the few cases where the sheriffs attempted to do something, and they were ostracized in the media. But for the most part, the police uh, take the side of the bully as well. So, I mean, people can read for themselves, but the, uh, you know, I, I, the conclusions to draw are obvious, because you look at how these cases are handled over and over again, and never handled logically. I mean, these schools should uh, be there to, uh, you know, the adults in charge there have always been there. They should be there to protect the most vulnerable. If, if some some bigger or more aggressive kids are, are doing, you know, you know har harming, uh, especially physically, but even psychologically, other kids, the adults in the room are supposed to recognize that and stop it. And the adults in the room never do. That's what I mentioned over and over again, the bullying that happens inside classrooms. And now there's no excuse for it because you have security cameras everywhere in our old world. So, but it doesn't help stop bullying because even though the cameras are everywhere, uh, somehow the school authorities can't val verify whether it happened, even though it's all filmed. It should be pretty easy to see. If somebody tells a story, hey, this somebody drives to me over here in this hallway, uh, okay, let's run the videotape, turn it on. But they never do. Half the time they won't even look at the tape because, again, they're protecting. And they're not admitting it, but that's what they're doing. They're protecting the social hierarchy. It may not even be consciously, but – and I have a section in the book that explains why this is, and that is I, I, I uh, go into the background. I list a bunch of celebrities and uh, successful people, Fortune 500 people, politicians, actors, you know. So it, 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 yeah, yeah. J Janis Joplin, Phil Spector, Lady Gaga. Yeah, well, they, well, they, they, yeah, they were they were bullied. Yeah, there there, there were lots of people that were bullied to them. But I list the people later, the celebrities that uh, that were big men and big women on campus. These were all people that were big athletes, prom queen, homecoming queen, and you'd be astonished at how you know Rosie O'Donnell was a homecoming queen. Uh, Woody Allen was a great high school athlete, played basketball, and baseball. Uh, it's amazing. How many, uh, how many of these actors that you wouldn't even suspect? Uh, so basically, my contention is, you know, you have people like Joe Biden was a big football star in the, uh, high school. Uh, Donald Trump was a, a baseball star. Uh, there's so many of these. So they were all jocks in high school themselves. They were part of that popular crowd. So when they, and certainly any, and almost all these guys who lived their fraternity life, because after they get out of high school, they go to college. And they uh, they join fraternities and sororities, and they just they refine the bullying and they come pay them. But it's the same kind of mentality. And these are the people that then go on to success in life, and they are the ones who become the CEOs and the, the local representatives and uh, things like that. And so, basically, you know, is it bowling for soup? Uh, they had that song, "High School Never Ends." There's uh, there's a lot of truth in that. That it's basically the way our society is set up, it's still a hierarchy where uh, basically instead of popularity, you have success. And basically, you know, the, the most popular kids in school are basically uh, successful. That's what they're about as successful as you can be about in high school. So, and so they go on, and all the statistics show another cherished myth is that the, uh, 
the guy who was picked on, the nerd that was picked on, and, you know, and sort of, you know, stuffed in his locker by the high school quarterback. Well, he'll go on to be that quarterback's boss. You know, the, the quarterback will be, he'll, he'll uh, flame out. He peak in high school. And now, uh, unfortunately, all the statistics show that the more popular you are in high school, the more successful you tend to be in life. Longer life expectancy, better health, more children, all, every possible, possible and positive attribute. Uh, and I hate to, you know, to be the bearer of bad news like that, but that, that's unfortunately what the stats show. So that's why really need, we really need to examine the social hierarchy. But uh, nobody wants to do it. And I found, you know, talking to the so-called anti-bullying experts, I talked to them, communicated with them. Every one of them sides with the bullies, every single one. They don't see anything I'm saying. They, oh, I don't think it's the hierarchy. I think, so you don't want to solve a problem. Because you, you know, you you're not gonna you start a foundation to have, and some of them say we're gonna have the, the most popular high school players working to stop bullying. You no, know, the most popular high school players are the bullies. You know, understand? This is a joke, but but that's the way they approach it. And so uh, it's like everything else in our society. You know, the wrong people are in charge, and uh, they're they're not proposing solutions that are gonna help the vast majority of people. So whatever they're proposing here. It's not going to stop, but it's not going to help the people, you know, because for, for the most part, kids in high school, they're, you know, like, like I was, you know, they just didn't want to be there. Boring, you're struggling to stay awake in class. And, but for, uh, for people, a small group at the top, it's, you know, it's a dream that looks like going to heaven every day. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's fantastic. It's utopian. <laughs> And age when your hormones are racing and your peers, you know, the, the, the opinion of your peers means everything to you and you're worshipped by your peers. The teachers worship you and treat you differently because you're popular. It's a great experience for them. But then for another small group at the bottom, it's absolute hell. Uh, you know, so the, I, I, you know, and, and we ought to, it, it, that should not be the case. But you can't make it not a hell for them without making it not a heaven. For the people at the top, you know, you have to you have to pull the plug on the emphasis on sports. You know, stop you know uh, having this tradition of all the football players wear their jerseys to class every Friday. And the cheerleaders wear their outfits. You stop doing that. All that does is, is build up their egos and make them even more arrogant. But again, I know I'm just choking it with all. Uh, no, virtually no one agrees with me on this. I don't think. Well, it, it, you do bring up the point that. America really emphasizes uh, f football and basketball, um, yeah. and and the you know the uh, cheerleaders, uh, all the games. Um, China doesn't have high school or, or you know school yeah. sports. They're they're right. really emphasizing academics. How, how is that uh, the Chinese system working for them? Well, I think you can look. I mean, it's it's not uh, it's not an idea. I mean, there's a totalitarian system, but uh, they're certainly much better off academically than we are because that's, you know, if there, if there should, if there is anything such as a popular kid in school, it should be the kids that are doing the best at academics because that's why they're there. Mm -hmm. As I point out, the, the class valedictorian is never popular unless they also happen to be, uh, you know, uh, you know, as, as far as uh, in the sports or maybe a cheerleader or a homecoming queen, they're very pretty if they're a girl. Yeah, then they can be popular. But they're never popular because they're a good student. It's never been cool to get good grades. In fact, it's usually uncool a lot of times, at least was when I was in school. And so that's and that's something twisted about that because you're there for the purpose of getting an education. But those that are that are doing best at, at, at you know supposed to be doing in their school, they're not popular. They're the people that are doing that are popular are the tough guys and the, the hot girls. And uh, the people that are, you know, cheering and, and, and the people that are playing uh, primarily, you know, football and basketball, those are the – baseball doesn't seem to do, do it as much in high school, but those are the two sports that, that rule schools. 
And uh, that should not be the case, but I go over the budgets of these schools and how much they'll spend on new stadiums and new gymnasiums. And they certainly aren't going to spend that kind of money on new computers for the kids. I mean, they're, 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 they, 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 you know, they want their sports and it brings in revenue because you get to sell tickets for the yeah, you know, it's, it's a reflection of our society at large, and uh, you know, we see that in college athletics and the alumni and how much money they put in college sports and so forth. And uh, yeah, the building of the new, all the new stadiums. I, I'm used to being, you know, going against the grain, but I know on this, and I, I, I've had people agree with me that, especially ones that were bullied, you know, because I've heard about people that, you know, say, hey, thank, thanks, you know, you're, finally somebody told that, you know, I could relate to something because they were, they went through torture in high school. And, you know, in some cases, people, you know, you're talking about middle-aged or even elderly people that can't let go of what they experienced. It was so bad for them that they they, they weren't able to lead a normal life. They, they couldn't get married. Some of them, you know, probably are virgins. They couldn't, you know, date the opposite sex. They had no confidence, no self-confidence. Uh, they couldn't hold a uh, job. They didn't make that much money. And uh, that's that's shameful because some some stupid kids or kids when they're in school decided they wanted to belittle and you know and mm-hmm. ridicule or maybe beat up somebody and uh, and nobody holds them accountable and so I'm sure it's still doing it you know it's it's still there and it's uh, I don't know maybe the bullyocracy will get in the hands of some honest uh, <laughs> super school superintendent or something they'll recommend it for required reading but uh, I kind of doubt it. Well, it, it, it seems that uh, your writings aren't really uh, about trashing uh, people. It, it, it's, it, you know, you're, like you, you just said about bullyocracy is hopefully get in the right hands to make a difference. And, and I think that's one of the impressions I got about your works is... Yeah, you, 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 know, you are trying. You know, just looking at the available information and how to learn, and improve yourself or the the culture by understanding what was going on, uh, whether it's through contrast, like. Uh, Lincoln and uh, President uh, Franklin Roosevelt mm-hmm. being able to compare and contrast and come away with a, a greater understanding of the people, uh, the times, and apply it to uh, you know, like we said, like you know, uh, understanding, you know, just say January sixth. Yeah, I think, well, you know, I think, uh, sorry, my iPods have burned out here, so I hope you can still hear me, but, uh, yeah, it's, um, I try to, you know, approach these things as, uh, <clears throat> as reasonably as I can, I, you know, the people that read my books tend to, you know, be overwhelmingly favor them, you know, I don't get a whole lot of negative, I do get some, but, uh, but in this case of bullyocracy, like, like I had one teacher that, uh, you know, trashed the book and only read, like, the first chapter or something. And, and you know, they said, well, teachers try, and he didn't say anything about principals. Well, I have tons of stuff. I talk about principals, school, school superintendents, and everything. Uh, so they obviously didn't read that far into the book, but they were just incensed by criticizing teachers. And, you know, again, it, it, we're seeing with the lockdown and everything and the way these teachers have acted, I'm sorry. The profession, I mean, they're good teachers, but... There's a whole lot of bad ones out there, and they need to be taken to task because they're frankly disgraceful. Okay, and, hey, uh, well, well, Don, I'm going to be taken to task if we run over. Uh, oh, I just, okay, I, no, well, I just wanted to say thank you for being the guest, and My pleasure. Uh, we will talk soon, and hopefully uh, part three will be out, and you're welcome to come back. Absolutely, I enjoyed it, Mark. Thanks for having me on. All right, take care. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone.